there's no substitute for practice. You gotta love what you do. You have to love music. And the other thing I would uh, advise young people in any profession is to be nice to everybody. Because you never know who's gonna open a door for you and take you down the path. Tom, multi-instrumentalist. This is a whole nother talent and degree that has opened up for you that has you performing with some of the greatest arts in the history of music that I have seen. I can't even name them all, from Frank Sapper to Harry Connick to Whitney to Cab Calloway, Pat Metheny, Paul McCartney, Lady Gaga. This is, you, have, you are the thread now to all these great artists, so I thank you so much for coming here and welcome to the Sessions panel. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. Tell me about where it started. Music. I mean, how did all, where did all these instruments pop into your life? At, was it at a young age? Or? I started playing the violin when I was five. Hmm. I gave it up when I was ten. Because <laughs> uh, I wanted to play football or some stupid something and uh, just, you know, boy stuff. And when I was 11, I heard the marching band outside the window, and it, and it seemed kind of a cool thing. I, on the school uh, monitor system, they said one day, they said, anybody who wants to be in the band, come to the band hall Thursday, so, and bring your parents. So I did. I showed up there with my parents, and uh, the guy from the music store had everything laid out, and I, I picked up a trombone, and I could almost play it. Uh, and my father asked him how much it was, and they told him, he said, we can't afford it. So we're walking out the door, and the band director grabs me and says, the school has a tuba, you don't have to buy anything. So I started playing the school's tuba. And then the, the next year, uh, we, got, we got a new band director, and he was a professional trombone player. And uh, he saw me looking at his horn one day, and he said, you want to play that, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> so he says, well, look, you can, you can just borrow my horn until you can get your own horn. And he showed me where the positions were, gave me a little beginner book, and said, go home and learn how to play it. So I did, and I could play um, all the music in about three weeks that, the band, oh, that we had in the band. Well, it wasn't a... It was a small rural school in Mississippi, and the level of the music was not that high. Right. It wasn't complicated at all. Were you listening to music at that time? Was there music that you were being influenced by? Uh, I was listening to the radio. This band director that was a trombone player had some records of jazz trombone players. So yeah. I've listened to some of that stuff in his office when I had a chance. Anyway, I, my, my grandmother gave me $100 out of her Social Security check oh. for to buy a trombone. Oh, wow. I saved up enough money to buy a record by mowing yards and raking leaves. And uh, I went to the music store and you could put the record on and listen to it before you bought it. I mean, this, is, this was great. This, I know some kids have never seen a record, but <laughs> an, an anyway. An LP, right. <laughs> an LP, yeah. Anyway, so I found this one called The Persuasive Trombone of Irby Green. This guy was such an amazing trombone Irby player. Green, I met Irby Green. Irby oh, Green, this oh, guy my was goodness. serious. I just wanted, it, it, it blew my mind. Yeah. I, I took this record home and it, listened to it over and over and over and played along with the record. I just wanted to sound like this guy. Yeah. And so he was my teacher, whether he knew it or not. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I could play the tuba and I could play the trombone. And my little brother got a cornet. So when he wasn't playing that, I learned to play the cornet. And it, to me, in my mind, it was just a small tuba. Same fingerings, everything was the same, sort yeah. of. But one night, uh, my life changed drastically. Uh, some kids came over to my house and said, "You want? we're going to start a rock and roll band. Do you want in? I'm like... Sure. So uh, I got up my trombone and they looked at me like I was crazy. This is 1961. Okay. <laughs> and I said, what's up? And they said, you don't have trombones in rock and roll bands. I didn't know I rock and roll. You know, I didn't know anything about rock and roll or anything. I didn't know. I was just a, a farm kid that milked cows and hauled hay and picked corn and stuff like that. I, I wanted to be in the band because I wanted to meet girls and I wanted to hang with the guys. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so uh, they, I said, well, I want to be in the band. What am I supposed to do? And, and he said, they said, well, you got to play saxophone. So my f best friend in high school was there, and he had an alto and a tenor sax with him. So I started learning to play the saxophone that night. And I was very motivated to learn to play this thing. How'd you learn the fingering? I mean, you had... He showed me, and, he, and, I, and, and, and the next day I got a fingering chart. And you just put the, your nose to the grindstone and just did it? Yeah, just learned to play it. <laughs> and we were doing gigs with that band in about three weeks. Oh, wow. I remember the first, uh, the, on, the, on the first gig, the guitar player who was the leader of the band, the lead singer, he leans over to me in the middle of a song and says, play a solo. And I'm like, what am I supposed to play? He says, anything you want. Yeah. If I started thinking about what key we were in and what notes, sound, some notes sounded better than others. And yeah. it was kind of like teaching a baby to swim by just throwing him into the pool. That's the way. Hello. Yeah. That's the way. So I, anyway, I was motivated to learn quickly how to improvise and, and do this sort of thing. When I got to college, I bought a flute one day. I saw a flute for $75 on the bulletin board. I was able to send myself to college by playing gigs. Well, it seems like, it's almost like 
fate had a big hand in throwing you these different opportunities for you yes. to start to widen your potential of musical instruments. Absolutely, absolutely, mm. yeah. So I went, I went to school in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and I, I was playing with their jazz band. I wrote some arrangements, and we went to the Mobile Jazz Festival in the spring of 1967. And uh, I met Lou Marini there, and he was playing with the North Texas band. He'd written some charts, and he played some solos. Yeah. I'd written some charts and played some solos. So we got to hear each other and meet each other, and he says, he says, man, you should really transfer to North Texas State next year. So I did, and that changed the rest of my life drastically, mm -hmm. too. An amazing school with great teachers. And I still, uh, yeah. uh, Lou is, uh, you know, one of the yeah. nicest people I ever met, one of yeah. the best musicians I've ever met. Yeah, and yeah. Played, we played on a million gigs. So now you're in, you're in the school band, you're, 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 you're at school, you're playing, you're learning. Are you now listening to different types of music? Are you playing oh, yeah. with different musicians oh, now? That was this guy that had played lead trumpet with Stan Kenton <laughs> was playing in the school band. Incredible. And he said something one day in our dinner rehearsal. He says, you should play that more like some trombone player from some big band. And I said, I don't know who that is. And he was, he was so shocked. He said, he said, man, he says, you got to come over to my place and hang tonight. So we went over, and he's got this beautiful stereo and hundreds of albums. And I went over there every night from then on hmm. to this guy's house. And he had every jazz record of every sort, you know, Coltrane, Miles Davis, yeah. Buddy Rich. You, you name it, he had it. And so that was a big part of my education musically. So now you're starting to really listen to different musicians, oh, yes. how they phrase yeah. their tone. I heard Jimi sound. Hendrix over at his house. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. his first album, Are You Experienced, came out. Oh my goodness. That changed my life. <laughs> An too. eye opener, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And because it was uh, different music yeah. than I was used to hearing. Yeah. And it, it uh, blew my mind a little bit. So were you starting to play with other musicians now and making money doing this? How, how, how'd well, I had, I, had to, I had to play gigs to send myself to college. I became the contractor for big bands from New York. Warren Covington and the Tommy Dorsey Band called me up. We got a job in uh, Austin. Can you get a 16-piece band together for me and meet me? Uh, you know, and we'd, we'd go in and sight. We'd be, pretend to be somebody's regular big band. Uh, How old are you at this Benny time? Uh, 19. 19 years old, you're getting called to now book the I'm band. A contract, <laughs> I was a contractor at North Texas State for big band gigs. Les and Larry Elgart, um, uh, Tex Benneke and the Glenn Miller Band, <laughs> Ralph Flanagan, you know, all, all the big bands that would, would come through the area. Yeah, yeah. I contracted a horn section for The Temptations, Little Stevie Wonder. Absolutely. When he was 16. Oh my gosh. The Supremes, before it was Diana Ross and the Supremes. Yeah. Uh, Martha and the Vandellas. So you're, you're became, already influenced by such a wide variety of music. Oh, yeah. You're right in the thick of it. <laughs> that, well, yeah, the, the, playing with the Temptations, that, that changed my life, too. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. When, uh, when it hit the stage, everybody was on their feet for the rest of the night. And meeting, meeting Stevie Wonder when he was 16, too, that was amazing. That was 1969, I think. Um, yeah. And he took me in somehow. He liked me. I don't know why. Huh. He, but uh, he says, says man, he said, man, I'm writing my own music. At the time, he was just performing music that was written by the uh, other people. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like the staff writers at Motown. So right. I'm writing my own songs. You know, you want to hear some of it? And he had a portable cassette and, and ear, earphones and everything. You want to hear some of it? And I'm like, sure, I put it on. And that blew my mind, too. And I said, who plays on this? He says, I played everything. All instruments so, he played. Yeah. Drums and everything, yeah. Dr yeah. Drums, guitar, bass, yeah. keyboards, yeah. Yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. But what an opportunity, the fact that you, even to meet, meet the magic of the legend of Stevie Wonder, to see that he was just he felt something and he just went with it. Oh, yeah. And that allowed you to start to see that this is possible. <laughs> I got to play with him many times uh, wow. during my career on, on, you know, on TV and different TV shows. Yeah. Last time uh, we played, backed him up on the Letterman show, ran him to him in the elevator, and I told him who I was. And, he, of course, he remembered me. How and amazing. he says, it's nice to see you. How great is that? Yeah. How great is that? Well, what a talent this guy is. And I, most people don't realize that he can play jazz, he can play anything. Uh, we, were, we did, we did yeah. a, um, a very special Christmas TV special in Washington with Stevie. And while it, they, they stopped the show because they want to change the lighting or something, so he starts playing giant steps ba -da 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 on the <laughs> keyboard. And then he starts improvising on it too, just going nuts <laughs> while playing the bass line. A profound musician, and just the fact that he wrote Sir Duke about Duke Ellington and just oh. these great, great artists that he kind of put into his pop song the legacy of these great people that came before us. What a beautiful person, a beautiful human he is, yeah. Amazing, amazing uh, guy. On so you're now playing with all these different bands, you're, you're experiencing this here. You get out of college now, what's the next step? Well, I uh, went on the road with Woody Herman's band and mm -hmm. then uh, moved to New York, just on the spur of the moment. I called up a friend and I said, can I crash on your floor? He said, yeah. So I came up, just kind of started over. 
I was doing a lot of professional work. I was doing a couple of studio dates a week in Dallas when yeah. I was in college. And, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I moved myself into a pretty good professional place there. Started completely over by moving to New York. So I'm, I wanted to meet people. There was a rehearsal studio where big bands rehearse. It was almost across the street where, where I was crashing. And so yeah. um, I'd go over there with my trombone and just wait for somebody to not show up or be late. And, and just to meet people. I eventually started getting some calls. Uh, some of the people that I had contracted for when I was in college, they contracted one-nighter jobs. Interesting. So I, I started doing that. I'd, you know, we'd drive to West Virginia, do a job, turn around, come back. And, and I, I was doing that for a living for a while. What amazing, you know, from the farm to the Big Apple. Oh I mean, yeah. That's a, what, what do you think was the, the ingredient that drove you to make that commitment? I had some experiences in Mississippi that changed my life too. Uh, 1965, Back, back, back in Mississippi, back at the time, you had, you had white bands and black bands, but right. you didn't have, you know, it was a segregated society and, right. and musically segregated too in Mississippi. My dad uh, and a friend of his uh, took me out to a nightclub one night and to hear this rhythm and blues band, and, uh, and uh, it was adults. And I'd been playing with little high school bands, you know, and, and white, of white kids. This black rhythm and blues band blew me away. It was adults. I mean, they were, they were all professionals yeah. and just blew my mind. A couple of weeks later, I go to the music store to get my horn, my trombone repaired, and the drummer from that band is the new instrument repairman. His <laughs> name was Terry Leggett, and we hit it off, and we started talking about music, and, uh, and I told him that I wrote arrangements and stuff, so he said, uh, if you wrote an arrangement for my band, we could learn these new songs a lot faster. So I wrote an arrangement, and I showed up at rehearsal with his band, and hit it off with all these guys. <laughs> so I, I wrote another arrangement for him, and, and then he calls me up one day, and he says, uh, one of my horn players has to lead music for a revival between Christmas and New Year's. He says, I've got a job every night. He says, you want to play with my band? And I'm like, sure. I did something that nobody ever did <laughs> in Mississippi. And it's, but anyway, it showed me, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot about sociology and yeah, music absolutely. during this experience. And I decided that I wanted to move to New York where everybody gets along and everybody can play together. Yeah, and I yeah. can play with whoever I want to. Yeah, yeah. You know without being hassled. It was a very different scene as it still is in New York. You know, it, th there's no color or religious. Oh. You play music. Everybody gets along in Everyone New York. gets that's, along. That's, I, that, wanted to, I wanted to move to New York for that, that reason. melting pot, And I think yeah. that's one of the reasons that the rest of the world hates us to some extent. <laughs> because everybody point. gets along. Interesting point, interesting, yeah. very interesting point. So you, you said you got involved in arranging. So where did the arranging part come in? Did you learn that in school? Well, I, or when that... I was about 13, I heard this record on the radio and it, to tweak my interest in, like, what, how do those notes fit together? And what mm -hmm. makes this, it was called Midnight in Moscow by Kenny Ball and his jazz men. It was a British Dixieland band. So I, I w went out and bought the single and I listened to it and I did my best to transcribe it and to, you know, hear all the notes and put them all together. And, um, and then one day at the music store, I used to drive these people crazy. <laughs> I'd, uh, uh, I, found, I found the written arrangement to this song and I was able to check and see how close I, and I was very close to it. So um, from then, I just started uh, writing more arrangements. And did you, you offer them to bands? Were you starting to sell these arrangements? Is that, was that a part of it? Not really, not really selling them, but um, I started writing arrangements for the college band I started, right. and, and writing arrangements at North Texas State. Got, got involved in arranging when I got to New York. One of the first gigs I got was Saturday Night Live. Hmm. Well, it actually goes back further than that. Uh, I, I wrote arrangements for Frank Zappa. I wrote arrangements for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Great horn band and yeah. this horn band Zappa. So too, when yeah. I got the job at Saturday Night Live, I mentioned to the music director that I had arranged for, for the, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and he immediately made me his arranger <laughs> at Saturday Night Live. And it was a new, a new concept kind of for tele television to have a small horn section. All the bands, uh, you know, in 1970 when I moved to New York, all yeah. the shows had big bands. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. ever since Saturday Night Live, New shows that have started after Saturday Night Live have all had smaller bands. How amazing to see. So you're meeting some of the greatest musicians in the world now in New York, Saturday Night Live band, you're meeting these guys. Absolutely. Is that how the networking, you started networking with these people? Several things happened uh, that changed the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm crashing at this guy's house. He goes back on the road with, with Woody Herman and this friend named uh, Hannibal Marvin Peterson, a trumpet player, jazz trumpet player, calls me up from Denton. He says he wants to come to New York. Can, I, can he crash on my floor? I'm like, sure, come on up. <laughs> so he started playing with Rassam Roland Kirk mm -hmm. and Gil Evans. And one night he had two gigs. He had both, both bands had gigs. And the Gil Evans gig didn't pay anything, so he asked me if I wanted to sub for him on trumpet. So I went to this gig at uh, Westbeth, and I met all these people that changed the rest of my life. Howard Johnson, mm -hmm. 
Lou Soloff. Yeah, Lou. David Sanborn. <laughs> Bruce Ditmus. Yeah. Uh, David Horowitz. Mm -hmm. uh, Herb Bushler. Dave Bargeron. The best. Yeah. Billy Harper. Yeah, Billy Harper. And all these things led to playing with you know, Saturday Night Live with Blood, Sweat and Tears, recording with Dave Sanborn. You know, just all these things. So now you're in the thick of it, you're working, you're in New York. What was it like to maintain that? I mean, and how do you maintain the business part of it? You, know, you got people that are calling you and you're doing dates. Oh, yeah. You know, are you an organized person? Yeah, absolutely. I'll write everything down. Back then, this is you know, before computers, yeah. you had what you call a week at a glance book. Right. And you wrote down all your gigs, exactly where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to wear, exactly what instruments to bring. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, you have to, uh, you know, if, if you're going to be a professional, you've got to show up on time. You've got to wear whatever it is that they want you to, if it's a, right. you know, a stage a stage show, and uh, you got to get along with everybody. So I always made a point of doing all those things and being nice to everybody, too. Boy, this is great advice to this next generation to understand what it takes to survive in the music industry today. The most important thing, I think, in the music business or any business is to be nice to everybody mm. because you never know who uh, is going to open a door for you. Mm. You never really know. So uh, just be nice to everybody, and you can't go wrong. Let's say uh, a, a contractor wants to hire a trombone player, and he can either hire me or he can hire this other guy who plays on the same ability level as myself. Right. Who's he going to call? Interesting. He's going to call the nicest guy. Yeah, yeah. Do you want, do you want frowns or smiles yeah, in the room? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my best advice. Boy, that's fantastic advice. You know, it sounds like the school music program was a big part of your life as far as the development of your your ability at a young age. You know, we're losing these school music programs now oh, no. throughout America. They're, they're, oh. they're, 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 they're being suppressed, they're not funded enough. You know, of course, sports gets the money, music does not many times. But it seems like that was really a big part of your, of your foundation. So the school band uh, had, you know, had a marching band and that was the main function it was to play the football halftime. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was yeah. associated with the sports. And yeah. It was students from the fourth grade to the twelfth grade, all in one band. So the, wow. the ability of the, I mean, the ability level of music was not that complicated. Right. That allowed me to learn to play the different different horns. I could, you know, I I learned to play all the parts on the tuba, and then I learned to play all the parts on the trombone, and I learned to play all the parts on the trumpet. So I was interested in music. I didn't know exactly what to do with myself. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But I get a kick of the fact that you go from, from cornet to tuba, that you, you found a similarity in that. And you <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found the, and the saxophone and the flute, you know, very similar. Yeah. Boy, how amazing. You know, I, I get a kick out of it, Tom Bones Malone, on your card. You really, this business card really is a great example of what a business card should be like. Well, you know, if, you, if you're going to, you want to do business, uh, it's, it's difficult to say to someone, Hey, I'm the greatest trombone player there is. You should hire me. Right. That sounds jive. That's yeah. not going to work. Yeah, so you, yeah. if you the business card uh, saves you a lot of talking. Mm. You present yourself in a business fashion, mm. and then the and the business card has the information that they need. It's got your phone number and your email address on it. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of gigs are on email nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah. They just can't take it. So so business wise, you have yourself set up where you're 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 able to be communicated way way of email by way of text messages Absolutely. by way of. Absolutely. Facebook Messenger, there's probably all Any, different ways people are reaching you, right? Exa exactly. Absolutely. Make yourself easy to find. So you have to be that skilled and focused. The balance of business and the balance of art is what we're talking about here. Absolutely. So is there a schedule you put yourself from on an artistic level as far as practicing and maintaining your skill base? I definitely practice. I still practice. I'm 71 years old and I still practice every day. Yeah. Organization though, every, every day is kind of different for me. I fly someplace, I have a gig someplace. Yeah. Uh, you know, every day is, is kind of different, so it's hard to... You know, I'm not at home every day, so... Uh, so but, but you still have to maintain that balance of absolutely. business and, and, and skill base. Sure. And I have, to, I have to exercise, too. I, you know, I do hand, hand weights and 300 crunches every day. And, really? Yeah. yeah. Listen, you're in great shape. Well, 71, yeah. you look fantastic. Well, I know I, you had mentioned your wife is, is a nutritionist. Yes. Yeah, that's one of, one of the reasons. We, we eat healthy and we exercise. So that health balance, but that's a very important part to maintain the energy level that we need to do what we do. I know... I travel a lot and performing a lot, and it's an intense schedule. Yes. So if we don't keep ourselves in good physical condition, we're going to have challenges yes. along the way. The, the, the reason we practice is we want the horn to play itself. When you drive your car, you don't think about it. You're right. thinking about everything except driving your car. When you walk, you're thinking about everything except walking. You walk, your body walks automatically. You drive the car automatically. Yeah. And this is the way we want to play our instruments. We want the we want our body to play the instrument automatically. Absolutely. If Absolutely. I'm impro improvising, I have to listen to 
uh, some musical idea that's coming out of my brain, and the horn plays itself now. Hmm. I used to have to think about this and well, what chord is it and what notes are we? No, now the horn plays itself. I just think of the idea and it comes out. And that's why, that's why the more we practice, the more the horn plays itself. The instrument plays itself. It goes for all instruments. Ab, but that's a great, great personal constitution that you have, that you're putting the time into it to get to that level. Absolutely. You can't, it, it, you can't practice too much. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of young students that watch this, and uh, the whole purpose of this session's panel was to, to give this information so this young generation can even hear some of the names you mentioned. So, you know, you know, all these great, great musicians that you mentioned, I want them to go and do the research of who these people were, who influenced you, who were the people that kind of motivated you. Did you is, was there a mentor in your life of someone that you felt really was someone that believed in you? I guess the, the, the two biggest mentors uh, were, were um, Irby Green, who didn't know he was my mentor. <laughs> my senior year at North Texas State, uh, he came in as the clinician guest artist. So now I'm up on stage playing with Herbie Green. Wow. And he came over to my house the night before and had a beer with the guys, <laughs> took me out to breakfast the next day. I mean, he couldn't have been nicer to yeah. me. And yeah. so he was really a huge mentor to me. Wow. And a, a trombone player named Bill Watrous. I first oh. moved to New York in 1970. Bill, what a band he had. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I, I started playing trombone with this rock band, and, and Bill, he wanted, to, he wanted to play in that band, too. And yeah. so um, I just, well, I'll, I'll, I'll play bass, and you play, uh, I'll play electric, electric bass, and you play uh, trombone. And so we started playing together with that band, and we started playing together. Ten Wheel Drive, I started playing trombone with them. And, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, Bill wanted to play in that band. I said, hey, look, I'll play trumpet, you play trombone. And, <laughs> and, so we, and then he started his own big band, and we, so we, we were playing all, all the time together, and he started sending me in. He was very well established in the, the professional scene. He started yeah. sending me in to sub for him on recording sessions. Mm. And uh, that's where that part, you know, the recording part of my career started. Yeah. You know, it's a good, dear friend of mine just passed away a few months ago. Mm. But it's amazing. I love the flexibility you have in your, in your attitude and your playing ability that you'll play whatever instrument will best work in that situation. No ego in there. Just play for the music of what it is. Exactly. That's real special, Tom. That really is. Exactly. I just, I, if, if the band already has a trombone player, I'll play I'll baritone sax. I'll play whatever they, I'll play whatever they need. I just want to be, you know, be in the band and be a part of some music. That is a very, very healthy, positive attitude. What would you say in closing? We've got these young students that are watching this and they're hearing this this incredibly skilled musician at a high level of who you are. What would you say to this next level, this next generation of students, of how they can prepare themselves for the music industry? Well, there's no substitute for practice. If I could just take a pill and, and learn to play like that, I would do it, but there's no substitute for practicing. You gotta love, love uh, what you do. You have to love music and I love it enough to, uh, to practice. Mick Gillette, the famous trumpet player from uh, Tower of Power, <laughs> told me he doesn't practice, he always performs. If he's in his living room at his house, he's performing. In his mind, he's performing. There may not be an audience there, but he, doesn't, he says he doesn't practice, he's always performing. And I, I've taken that attitude uh, about when I, when I practice at home. I, you know, I, I'm, I pretend that I'm on stage and I'm playing in front of people. <laughs> what yeah. a very healthy outlook. And, and, and the other thing I would uh, advise uh, young, uh, young people in any profession is to be nice to everybody. Because mm -hmm. you never know who's going to open a door for you and take you down the path. Boy, fantastic. Well, it's quite evident that you have an incredibly high standard because every time you perform, you're performing at 110%. And that is something which has been evident in all the years that I've been influenced by hearing you play. But this is fantastic. All the musicians that I have met that I've worked with you have nothing but the highest accolades for you, Tom. Mm. You have done it and you are continuing to do it. On behalf of the sessions, we thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks.